Hello and welcome to the audio version of the PILPG Peace Negotiation Skills Briefing Paper, Negotiation Logistics. This version is intended to complement its written version. Throughout this conversation, we will explore logistical considerations critical for parties to peace negotiations to consider that are often left out of a proper preparation. We are joined again by Dr. Paul Williams, the founder and president of the Public International Law and Policy Group, who also holds the Rebecca Grazier Professorship in Law and International Relations at American University. PILPG is a global pro bono law firm providing free legal assistance and policy planning to support to parties involved in peace negotiations, post-conflict constitution drafting, and prosecuting atrocity crimes. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Nicole. It's great to be here again. Great to have you. To start off this particular conversation, I'd like to ask, when preparing for a negotiation, what is the first logistical step parties need to take? Nicole, the first thing that the parties need to do as they're preparing for a negotiation is to get to know the other side, their positions, their interests, what they might put on the table as, as draft language, what their red lines are, what their points of compromise are, what their points and strengths and weaknesses, what strategy might they be employing. Literally get into the head of your opposing party and understand how they're going to approach the negotiations so that they don't outflank you, and then understand what their interests and positions and needs are so that you can actually negotiate some type of resolution of the conflict. And this research and getting to know your other parties, would you also suggest getting to know the mediator? Oh, definitely, Nicole. There is no such thing as a bilateral negotiation. Anytime there's a mediator or a facilitator in the room, they have their own interests. They have their own objectives. Hopefully it's to get both parties or the multiple parties together for a successful peace agreement, but they will have their own strategic interests. Otherwise, they wouldn't actually be expending their time, energy, and resources to, to mediate or to facilitate. Similarly, they will also have strengths and weaknesses as mediators or facilitators. There's nothing, there's no magical powers that mediators have. And the institutions or the countries that are mediating may be good at certain things. They may not be good at other things. Individuals who are mediators uh, will have their own strengths and weaknesses. And then finally, different mediators can bring different resources to bear. Will they be able to help provide for reconstruction? Will be they able to help uh, reconfigure uh, the militaries with security sector reform or demilitarization and demobilization? Um, you'll want to know what it is that the mediator can promise or what you can ask for from the mediator to sweeten the pot to get to yes. Very interesting. Now we've discussed the who. What about the where? How do parties or mediators select a location for the talks? Nicole, if you want to know how contentious the mediation is going to be, just watch the negotiation over where they're going to hold the mediation or the negotiation. You know, these are highly contentious. There's always a perception that a location or a venue will give, a, will give an advantage to one party uh, or the other, or they may simply disadvantage a party by limiting their access because of the distance or because of the security required. Uh, and so the parties will really need to, to think through when a venue is proposed by the mediator, whether it does suit their interests or not, and what's genuine. Because oftentimes parties will have mythical perceptions. They all want to go to Geneva and, and do their negotiations at the UN Peace Palace, because that's Geneva. That's where successful negotiations are held. But sometimes that's not terribly accessible, and it's more accessible to do it in-country or in an adjacent country. Um, same thing with the mediator. Do you want the parties to have ready access to the media, to communications outlets, uh, to other experts, to their embassies, or do you want them isolated? What type of vibe? The Dayton Accords were at a military base. That was a particular vibe that the U.S. government and the European Union wanted to send to the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnians for different reasons. The French held Kosovo at the Rambouillet Chateau because that was a particular vibe. The nagorno karabakh talks were Key West at the Truman White House. Everyone's wearing parrot shirts, except for the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians who were still wearing their suits. But they were trying to get a relaxed vibe for that negotiation. So depending on what vibe the mediator wants to utilize for her or his 
efforts to get to yes, the venue can be really important. And there seems to be a lot of different outlooks on that. So thanks for sharing. Moving on a little bit more, we know the phrase that timing is everything. Does this hold true for when preparing to enter negotiations? Yes, the parties should always, and the mediator, should always be looking at the clock. The first time they look at the clock, is this conflict ripe for a negotiation? Are the, is there a hurting stalemate? Uh, is there an interest uh, among the parties to negotiate? Have, have economic sanctions uh, caused sufficient pain on the aggressor party to induce them to the table? Would it be a wasted effort? And might there be consequences to a failed effort that limit the ability of a successful peace agreement down the road? And then the second time they look at the clock is, okay, we're all here at Rambouillet, Key West, Dayton, Geneva. How long are we going to stay? Is this, we're here indefinitely? Or is this, we're here for three weeks, let's get on with it? What is going to be the timing of the rhythm, so to speak, of these negotiations? And again, depending on the nature of the negotiations, there's definitely no one size fits all. But you have to be thoughtful about the timing. And you also have to deal with real world consequences uh, and real world factors. I've been surprised at the number of times I've been involved in negotiations in, in Geneva and they've said, we have to wrap up by the 20th because the, this is true, this is true, the Swiss are doing a, a watch convention um, and all the hotels are booked. And so we have no room for civil society and the parties and all of that. I'm thinking, ah, yeah, peace in Syria versus watch convention. But when it comes to the Swiss, <laughs> those are about equal balancing factor. Those break three to one. Those are about equal prerogatives as far as they're concerned. So there are a lot of external factors that impact timing as well. So definitely the mediator and the parties need to be thinking about and be flexible. If there's no success, you can want to say, we only were going to be here three days anyways. And so the fact that the parties are all leaving is okay. Or if there is momentum, you want to be able to find a way to extend out those negotiations. And staying on these practical considerations, can you share more on what else parties might be able to do to prepare before arriving at a negotiation? Yes, definitely, Nicole. Before the parties go into a negotiation, they and the mediators uh, oftentimes can benefit from agreeing upon preconditions such as there shall be no threats of the use of force while you're in the negotiations, or there's a precondition there, there should be a ceasefire for a, a period of time while the parties are engaged. There's also the precondition of whether or not the parties will have access to the media or the condition that there will be civil society engagement or access to an eclectic array of, of actors and advisors for, for the parties as well. Oftentimes the parties will try, however, to have preconditions which prejudice the outcome. You know, the precondition will be that the rebels disarm. The precondition will be that the government power shares. Those aren't preconditions. Those are things you negotiate in a peace process. But a mediator should expect every single time for the parties to put forward preconditions that are actually outcomes of a negotiation, but redirect them to what are the preconditions that will make for a successful outcome. Now, one of the most difficult aspects of bringing parties to a negotiation is noticing or establishing trust between them. What more can parties do other than what you've spoken about already do to build trust between one another before beginning or entering negotiations? Yeah, Nicole, I think it's difficult to overestimate the deficit of trust among parties in a negotiation. It's always helpful to remember that literally back in the field, the parties are killing one another. They're oftentimes engaged in, in atrocities against the civilians that are members of each of the sides of the, of the conflict. And so for a mediator to say, oh, we're going to do some trust building exercises, we're going to do some confidence building exercises, then we'll get off to a roaring start. It's not really realistic. So one of the first things a mediator needs to do is to simply acknowledge that we've got two parties here there's no trust. You're here because you haven't accomplished your objectives on the battlefield. And so now you're going to try to accomplish those objectives in the negotiation. I get it. But you still need to build some trust. You still need to build some confidence. And here, even a temporary cessation of, of hostility, 
or even a joint appearance at the initial press conference, even if it's not a joint communique, just a joint appearance of the parties. So it's almost fake it until you make it. Start doing things that visually indicate that there is a budding level of trust and confidence between the parties because you're going to need that as a mediator when you're negotiating with the parties and trying to get them to agree upon draft language. They're going to need to trust you, the mediator. They're also going to need to trust each other that they might comply with this language that they're reaching an agreement on. You can then do some practical confidence building uh, measures as well. We talk, you know, cessation of hostilities, uh, letting through humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, letting some refugees return, letting some IDPs return to their homes. There's various small steps which relate to the drivers of conflict, which can indicate that the parties are actually willing to engage in the, the larger issues that will be necessary for a resolution of the conflict. And once we get to these larger issues, how do parties agree on what they will discuss during the negotiations? Oh, yeah. Once you argue about the venue for a couple of weeks, you're then going to argue about the agenda for, for a couple of more weeks. And, and this is important. This is where uh, I always encourage the, the parties that we work with to get your draft on top first, not only of a peace agreement, but also of, of an agenda. Um, you want to make sure that all of the issues that um, are driving the conflict are actually on on the agenda. It's exceedingly difficult to get something on the agenda once the negotiations have started, because then you're a spoiler. Then you're not negotiating in good faith. You, you're throwing in extra issues after we've gotten everybody here to Geneva or wherever for the negotiation, and you're undermining the process. And you're really like, no, actually, we want a comprehensive peace agreement. We want to resolve these drivers of, of conflict. So it's important to get them all on. It's also important to synchronize. And we can talk about that a little bit more if you want, but how you sync, how you sequence the, the various issues in the agenda so that uh, either as a party, your interests are dealt with initially, your important issues are dealt with initially, and then you put the other party's interests at the end. Now, as a mediator, you want to look at this and say, okay, how do I get, how do I choreograph? the issues from party A, party B, and any additional parties in a way that they can see that all of their issues are on the agenda and they can see that they'll either be dealt with more or less in equal priority. And so maybe you do multiple channels of negotiation so that the top four issues, two from each side, can be addressed initially. Or there's you do joint, you combine issues. There's all kinds of ways you can do it, but the agenda is not just a one page, okay, welcome, let's negotiate, let's sign an agreement, let's have a press conference. You really need to synchronize and choreograph the way in which you're going to carry out the negotiations in this agenda. Now, as a party, aside from perhaps offering your version of an agenda first, is there anything they can do to influence said agenda in their favor? Yeah, the party should make sure that the mediator understands that there will be negotiations on the agenda, uh, just as there are negotiations and consent for a venue. The party needs to ensure that there is an expectation of consent of the party on the agenda. It can't be that they show up, there's a press conference, and the mediator announces the agenda, and the party says, well, wait a second. And they say, no, no, we'll start negotiating tomorrow. It's like, no, no, no. The, the moment someone types agenda at the top of the piece, piece of paper, the negotiations have, have begun. So putting their agenda on the table first, signaling to the mediator that there needs to be consent for the agenda and consulting with the mediator. And the mediator is not going to take your agenda and cross off your name as a party and put their name on it, but they'll actually see what you have in mind for the talks. And it also helps working with the party to create an agenda. We found helps them focus on what their priorities are, but then articulating and sharing those priorities uh, with the mediator. Uh, and importantly, sharing them with their constituency and the media and saying, look, we're excited to come to Geneva for these negotiations, and we expect to discuss A, B, C, and D in those negotiations. And then you've publicly committed yourself and made clear that those are your expectations. Now, you may end up negotiating and say, we're only going to do A, B, and C, we're going to get D, E, and F later, but you've stated what it is that you're attempting to accomplish in those negotiations. What's the purpose? What's the agenda of being at that venue? Now, another very practical consideration for parties and mediators alike is 
understanding communication procedures. How do parties communicate with one another both prior to and even during formal negotiations? Yeah, Nicole, they communicate formally and informally. And I think this is something that's important too. Uh, and they also communicate through third parties or through the media. So it's important for a mediator to clearly um, outline for the parties how formal communication occurs within the negotiation. Do the documents go to the mediator? Then the mediator shares them with the other party or can the parties convey documents uh, directly uh, between one another with a copy to the mediator? Must everything be put in writing? Can they have oral proposals that if they're an interest, they could then follow up with something written because you don't want confusion. We talked about there's a deficit of trust. There's going to be a thin veneer of, of trust or an agreement to show a thin veneer of trust during the negotiations. And you don't want that to break down because the part one party is communicating in one way or via one channel and the other party is communicating differently, or the mediator seem as somehow being biased. Same thing with the mediator. A good rule of thumb is whenever a mediator shares a piece of paper, it shares it with both parties at the same time, or has two deputies at the same time going. You don't go to, you don't, as a mediator, you don't go to one party and send your deputy to another party. You have two deputies and you send them each, or you bring the parties to you together and you give them at the same time. Five minutes later than the other party is something that will erode trust. Parties are exceedingly prickly in these negotiations and things such as communication, as you note, are very important. It's also helpful to have informal communication. There's always members of these various delegations who have prior personal relationships before they split into the two different camps. And having that back channel or that informal negotiation can be really crucial to float ideas, to float possible solution to puzzles or conundrums, and to basically check the temperature of the other delegation. And that has played a key role in so many negotiations, this back channel approach. And then the parties communicate to each other through the media. Uh, oftentimes when they're giving a press conference, they're, you know, they're never talking to the general public. They're talking to their constituents, they're talking to the sponsors of the mediation, or they're talking to the other party. Sometimes they're simply making threats <laughs> to the other party, but other times they could be signaling possible points of compromise or possible ideas in the in the media. And so it's always important. It's I've always been surprised at how the parties will go to each other's press conferences because they want to know, you know what is the other, they can always watch it on TV, but they actually go to the other party's press conferences to one, find out what they're saying, and then to get a sense of how it's playing among the journalists. And then three, to give counter quotes. They're on hand when they say they're talking about territorial integrity. And then you say, well, yeah, what about our territorial integrity? Or yeah, territorial integrity is great. What about the right of self-determination? So it's an interesting sort of third level of the communication slash negotiation that occurs in the, in the media room. Very smart. Can you say a little bit more though on the informal or back-channel negotiations? Specifically, I'm curious about who is in charge of such communications and how is this person chosen? Yeah. So these back-channel communications should never be freelance. Uh, you never want the, the chairperson of, of the delegation to be surprised that a member of, of her or his delegation is talking to a member of, of the other delegation. Uh, and if a mediator, you certainly don't want to be surprised that a member of your team is talking unauthorized to members of, of the delegation on a purely social basis, because there's no such thing. In a, there's no private time in a negotiation while you're on site doing those negotiations. But as I mentioned, you'll find that there's points of commonality. We were doing negotiations in, in Doha, and there was a unique degree of friendliness between the, the deputy negotiator in, on the Darfuri delegation and one of the negotiators from the government side. And I asked about it, and they said, oh, our kids go to the same school in Khartoum. I was like, well, I thought you were you were, you were expat. You, oh yeah, I'm persona non grata in Sudan, but my family still lives in Khartoum in the same neighborhood as this gentleman's family, and they, they go to the same school. And so they had that in public and on the battlefield, they were at odds, but they had that interesting personal connection. And so they would have back channel conversations. You oftentimes want to have these back channel conversations publicly 
So no one, there are no conspiracies that develop around it. Now, sometimes that can be difficult, but you want it to be seen that you're having this conversation, even if it's a walking and a talking, because then no one can say, oh, there's something suspicious going on because, well, yeah, they were walking through the hotel lobby together having a conversation. How could it be? That's not how you do a conspiracy. You don't do it in the public. You almost always want to keep these types of conversations publicly visible and people know what you're doing. You're back channeling informally floating ideas and possibilities to get to yes. Now, my last question, as always, is a catch-all, but what other logistical considerations might there be once negotiations have commenced? So once the negotiations have commenced, it's really important to ensure that there is a way of structuring it so that it's inclusive as possible and can bring any additional interests. Spoilers who have see the process moving and want to be co-opted because as a mediator and as a party, you want to co-opt the spoilers. And if you're having a peace negotiation party in Geneva and you're making progress and you're starting to allocate power or do security sector reform or things along those lines, some of the spoilers may be intrigued or interested. And so you want to have designed a process for negotiation where you can incorporate some of those spoilers adjacent to the, the process. Or you'll get to a point, shifting gears, where it's important to bring in some refugees or IDP or special interest representatives. You want to have a process and a large enough venue where you can bring in the people who represent those constituencies and those interests and find a way for them to participate in the, in the process. So you want to maintain that flexibility. You, you have a finely tuned peace process, finely tuned agenda, a phenomenal venue. And now I'm telling you, you got to make sure that it's flexible enough to include other constituencies and interests adjacent to. You don't want to bring in additional parties. Once you've got three parties moving forward, you don't want to bring in a fourth and a fifth party because that'll undermine the trunk of the first three. Thank you, Paul. I believe that covers all of the logistical considerations parties will need to keep in mind when preparing for and are in negotiations. Thank you again for your time, and I look forward to more conversations. Great. Thank you, Nicole. It was my pleasure.